James, fantastic. So without further ado, we've already exchanged our small talk and I know you're very excited to start. So the floor is yours, James. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to say hello and welcome to everyone participating in iSpring Days, attending this session or watching it later. I'm so proud to be kicking off day one with a discussion I'm calling Context is King, Factors Influencing Effective Learning Transfer. My hope is that as the conference continues, you'll be thinking about all the ways you can make the learner's journey integral to your design and development practices, even as you are learning from the incredible group of L&D gurus iSpring has assembled for our benefit. Now I've presented remotely before from Colorado, and I know that there is sometimes a delay when I transition to, my, to the next slide, so I might pause for a couple of seconds when doing so as the presentation goes forward, just because I don't want anyone to miss any content that's on a slide. So let's talk about what you can expect from this session. Throughout the session, I'll be asking Chris to post some questions I have for you in the YouTube comments. Have your fingers poised and ready as I'd love for this to be more of a conversation and less a monologue. Also, Folks who watch later learn from your comments, so there's that. My primary objective for this session is to encourage a discussion about a concept I call the learner's journey. I'll be sharing some of my own experiences to explain what I mean by this. I'll also talk about the concept of learning transfer and why it's important. I'll describe some of the factors that can negatively impact effective learning transfer. These may be present in your current working or development environment. If so, hopefully after this session, you will be better able to spot them and take action to help mitigate them for your learners. Lastly, We'll talk about your next steps and how you might bring your enthusiasm and newfound wisdom about the learner's journey back to your clients or workplaces and begin transforming your learners in ways you never thought possible. This will be a chance for you to ask questions, share how you and your organization are creating opportunities for effective learning transfer, or talk about the challenges you face in that regard. Before we begin, let me say thanks for joining the session and for taking part in this year's conference. And thanks to the organizers, the session hosts, presenters, and everyone helping to make iSpring Days a great learning experience. I won't spend too much time on who I am, but it may be useful to know a bit about my background because after all, context is king. So while I am currently providing learning and development services to a number of clients as the director of Lighthouse L&D Consulting, before that, I spent over 20 years creating instructor-led and online training, managing teams of instructional designers, sales reps, and customer service reps, and implementing and managing a variety of learning management systems at many different companies. Corporate learning environments are where I've spent my career. I've specialized in the financial services sector with the occasional mobile tech startup, SaaS and employer services organization thrown in. On the slide, you can see my LinkedIn header. I always emphasize human-centric and learner-driven solutions, no matter what format or technology is currently in fashion. I believe that if you as learning experience designers are valued, are empowered to believe in yourselves, and your creativity and encouraged to learn all you can about your learners, you will be able to develop engaging and truly effective learning solutions. My hope is that everyone attending this conference or watching it later will take away from it my encouragement and my belief that you can transform your learners. If you haven't done so already, use the QR code to connect with me on LinkedIn let me know if you'd like a sounding board for any aspect of any project you're working on. And to quote one of my favorite DevLearn conference slogans, together we are better. Module one is the learner's journey. 
once upon a time, I was an actor living and working in New York City. Acting school taught me how to move people with my performances, reach them emotionally and create compelling characters. What I didn't know was that years later, when I found myself working for a payroll company as their first official training manager, something I learned as an actor would help me begin to create more effective learning. I'm talking about the moment before. You see, to create and convincingly portray a character's persona, you need to understand how the character lived before entering a scene. They came from somewhere, experienced something, and that something is influencing how they behave in the present. And for this concept to translate, let's imagine that for our metaphorical purposes, that character is one of our learners. And let's call the present moment the moment of formal learning. Okay, you may be asking, but what do acting and the moment before have to do with creating effective learning or the learner's journey for that matter? Chris, I'd like to give folks a chance to weigh in. Let's put the first question in the comments. What might the moment before have to teach us as learning experience developers? Now, I know there could be a delay, so we'll give folks a chance to weigh in. Uh, but if none come in right away, but they do come in later, uh, or if we get two or three. Oh, good. I can see posts coming in already. Tell us what the learner already knows. Brilliant. Prior experience. Some people were answering before the question was even posted. Well done. What is their lens for understanding? Their motivation? Learners bring their past experience, knowledge, and perceptions to the lesson. Fantastic. These are all really great comments, and they are all very much spot on with where we're going next. Um, so I guess I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and move on, but thank you so much to everyone for weighing in on that question. Next, we're going to talk more about the learner's journey. So. In case you hadn't guessed it, the learner's journey begins long before they encounter your learning solution. Then it intersects with the learning experience you've worked so hard to create at what is sometimes referred to as the moment of formal learning. It's easy to focus mostly on the point when our learner will experience our masterful in-person training or our brilliant e-learning course. After all, that's the part of the learner's journey that has to do with us, right? And many times we are tasked with conveying a great deal of information that is important and very engaging at that moment. So we have a lot on our minds. But our learners were living life and experiencing conditions on the job long before they encountered us. And like how getting stuck in traffic that makes us late or having a negative interaction with a coworker can impact our day, there are many factors acting upon your learners that could influence how they receive and interact with your learning solution. We'll talk about some of those factors in a moment. And then the learner's journey continues, hopefully for a very long time. It is after the moment of formal learning that the lasting effectiveness of the learning transfer is revealed. In the hours, days, weeks, and months Following their encounter with your learning solution, their behavior and actions will either reflect the effectiveness of their learning experience, or they will revert to the ways of the moment before, negating the value of time spent either creating or taking the training. So, with that being said, how much time and attention should we pay to this idea of effective learning transfer? And what do we mean by it exactly? Module two talks about learning transfer. And I love this quote. Begin at the beginning, the king said very gravely and go on till you come to the end, then stop. Paul Matthews quotes the King of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland to make the point in his excellent book, Learning Transfer at Work, that most training fails because it does not start at the beginning and does not keep going until the end. 
The phrase learning transfer gets bandied about in many different contexts. When I talk about it with clients, it's usually in the realm of how learning can affect desired behavioral changes for employees, which in turn lead to desired outcomes. Used in a corporate or organizational context, it usually refers to the uptake of learning by individuals exposed to a prior formal training moment, such as a training course or an e-learning course. The application of learning is key, so the term learning transfer means much more than just the transfer or movement of learning from one place to another. It also means the translation and application of the learnt knowledge, skills, and attitudes into effective action that improves job performance, is sustained over time, and is beneficial for the output of the workflow. One goal of training can be to make the learning gained from the training experience portable, so a learner takes it to new places where it can be used. If a learning experience does not achieve significant transfer and the subsequent application of the learning, how much can we say it's worth? Where is the measurable ROI? Speaking of ROI, I'd like to say for anyone who's not yet been asked to justify the existence of a learning team or even an entire learning department to a business owner asking you to show them the money it can be the thing of which nightmares are made. Learning transfer that can be measured in terms of ongoing employee performance, reduced risk, increased efficiencies, and lower operating costs is the glass of cold water in the face that can wake you from that bad dream. Chris, I'd like to give folks a chance to weigh in on this topic. Can we put question number two in the YouTube comments? Our question is, if learning transfer isn't being discussed regularly at your workplace, why might that be? And again, if questions come in, uh, don't come in directly, but they do later, feel free to let me know, Chris. Speaking of which, oh, Let's okay, see if, very good. If we do have any comments coming. We do already, actually. If Excellent. you can see now, um, if you don't, then I probably can read them out loud for you. You can pick a few. Of course, definitely my pleasure. So some people speak of fear of the results. The others uh, speak about time constraints. And for example, Michelle, if I read correctly, uh, says that they assume that it's go it isn't going to happen. So feels like there are very diverse answers from timing to culture, from um, lack of importance given to training in the workspace, to those requests in education not having enough knowledge about this learning. I love these answers, and it's telling me that this resonates with our audience. I'm really glad to hear that these are things that you've noticed and you've thought about and have some feelings about, um, and, they're, and they're all valid. They're all perfectly valid, and we're going to talk more about them as we continue. Um, by the way, I wanted to let folks know that if if folks who don't have an answer to my questions that you want to share, but you'd just like to thank Chris for her help or comment on the session in general, don't be shy. We appreciate you. We're glad you're here. And I'm glad Chris is here helping us out. So thank you, Chris. So next, we're going to talk about how important is learning transfer. So. While folks continue to think about if learning transfer is an important topic at their place of work or in their own L&D practice, let's examine why it should be. On the last slide, I alluded to how circumstances at your place of business could easily change to one where every operating budget is being looked at as a possible place to reduce costs and possibly headcount. In the L&D economy, being able to demonstrate the effectiveness of your output can be crucial to your existence and equally importantly, to your value as a positive change maker. I've said it many times before that we are in an honorable profession, one that on a good day can really make a difference for individuals seeking to better themselves and for organizations looking to get ahead by achieving three highly desired outcomes. 
employees performing at or above expectations, who are productive, and who contribute to a high-octane culture. Be proud, I say, and demonstrate your effective learning transfer. A final thought about the importance of learning transfer. It underpins the whole notion of training, and yet too often we focus on the transmission of information from the trainer to the trainee, or from the e-learning to the learner, and then the retention of the information by that learner. We tend to overlook the primary purpose of organizational training, an improved employee performance that can only happen when there is effective learning transfer. Let's talk about factors impacting learning transfer. So we've arrived at the heart of the matter, where the truth about the learner's journey, including how it relates to effective learning transfer and the role your learning solutions can play in contributing to the beneficial output of the learning workflow gets revealed. The following factors will influence the amount of learning that gets transferred back to job performance. That is, they show that effective transfer that effective transfer doesn't solely depend on how good a training course was. It also depends on the importance given to learning and development by an organization and whether the right training need was identified for the right person in the right job. And I saw in the comments and Chris reported from some of the comments that that resonated with some of you, right? In addition, how well the training course was designed to meet that need and how well the learners were prepared for the learning experience. Think about that. Being prepared for the learning experience the moment before. How well the trainers slash learning designers understood the learners' needs and how best to help them learn. And to what extent the learner was supported while trying to use the learning back at work. And that makes me think of the learner's journey as it continues, right? Well beyond the moment of formal learning. Notice how some of the factors are endemically linked to systemic circumstances. Systemic circumstances like a work culture may or may not support the development of solutions that deliver workflow-based learning. I'll talk more about what that means in a moment. Other systemic circumstances that these factors highlight include the ability and willingness on the part of line managers to actively support learners with one-on-one -on -one coaching or learning transfer check-ins after the moment of formal learning has ended. Another systemic circumstance that these factors reveal is a work environment that may resist the change represented by the learning. Employees who return to their roles with skills that represent new ways of working can face strong headwinds. Those assigned to perform tasks requiring a change in procedure or even work style due to the new behavior demonstrated by the newly trained may resent the extra work and subtly resist the learning integration. Few individuals, no matter how well-intentioned, can sustain the learning transfer expected in the face of such systemic challenges. Notice, too, that these are conditions that were likely well-entrenched long ago in the learner's journey and will likely be maintained in the future as the learner's journey continues unless specific action is taken on the part of the L&D department to mitigate them. Usually, this will require directed effort on the part of many individuals with the goal of affecting culture change. That part doesn't rest solely with you, although by becoming aware of them, you can play a role in bringing the situations that are negatively affecting learning transfer to the attention of those better positioned to take action. Chris, can we post the third question in the comments? I'd love to hear from our attendees. Exactly. Which of Absolutely. these great? Which of these factors or systemic circumstances have you encountered? To your knowledge, did they negatively impact learning transfer?
I can't wait to see your answers. If you have Thank encountered, you. pardon okay. me, please continue. That's okay. I was just going to say, if you have encountered these or other factors negatively impacting learning transfer, let us know. You needn't get too specific if you aren't comfortable doing so, but do let your peers know they are not alone. Okay, Chris, let us go ahead and catch me up with some of these comments. I see them flying in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, people say all of them. <laughs> <laughs> also, also, we have lack of support post-training. Line managers are not equipped to coach. Also, a lot of supporting comments on no follow-up or support on training. Mm -hmm. And sometimes employees who feel that it's a waste of time, lack of buy-in and feedback. So a lot of times I can see the word support, which is lack of support or missing support. As I can see, this is something that very much resonates. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, lots of people confirm that it's just all of them, but especially lack of support on the training for managers. I yeah. think that's just really great that m most of our uh, attendees who are about 370 uh, people right now are uh, super engaged and they give extended comments. And I see that there are even discussions uh, inside the chat and we very much welcome you to continue exchanging opinions because uh, if this isn't for the sake of the community, then why we're doing this. That's right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, those are amazing. Those are amazing comments and some great insights. Um, I am going to take just a moment and zero in on that, um, the comment I heard that was uh, managers aren't prepared to coach. I, I am someone to whom um, leadership and um, lifting others up within an organization um, is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I find there uh, that a good manager is one of the best, it, it can be literally the best thing about a job, but it can also be something that keeps you from feeling engaged or able to make a difference. Um, and that is a very common complaint and issue. And I think part of the reason it's an issue is that there is this lack of synergy between the business management and the L&D department in the area of leadership and follow-up and support for those employees that are trying to better themselves and many times trying to do exactly what the company is asking them to do. There needs to be training provided, <laughs> ironically, for those managers to help them understand the important role that they play in the training. It's not like their employees are going to go off to a training session for a week and come back and they will never have to talk to them about it or engage with them about it or support them in their work following the training. No, they should be well versed in what is being trained so that they can help assist that employee, lift them up and remove obstacles, hopefully. And my own personal experience tells me that that the, the risk of a manager who in their own microculture of a team doesn't actively promote the learning and support the learners and help them transition and transfer that knowledge throughout their part of the organization is one of the biggest uh, handicaps, one of the biggest problems in the area of um, learning transfer and learning effectiveness. So um, I say, you know, a great result of this conversation could be that folks go back and have an open conversation with their manager. And the next time you're thinking about some training or learning experience that you are uh, that you're interested in or you're being directed to take and, and say, you know, point blank, um, I know what my responsibility is as far as taking this training. But how are we going to work together to ensure that this is a good use of our time and that we can effectively change our culture as a result of us working together. So anyway, I just wanted to call out on that comment and say that it was wonderful to highlight that. And that is very true. And um, and uh, I think it's a I think it's, you know, really valuable insight to, to take away from this. Um, now we're going to move on to uh, improving how we can improve learning transfer effectiveness, right? Because we always want to be part of the solution. Okay. 
Oh, and uh, I found this Leonardo da Vinci quote uh, that I really love uh, related to this topic in my mind. He says, or said, I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. So when you think about all the amazing things that Leonardo da Vinci created and uh, ideas that he put forward in his lifetime, you know he was a man who believed in doing. He believed in applying. And uh, it's that very thing that we are all about as uh, learning designers. Uh, he speaks to our desire to affect change through action. We, as learning designers, are fortunate indeed to be counted among the, quote, positive change makers, if I can quote myself. So, talking about improving learning transfer effectiveness. I mentioned workflow-based learning a moment ago. That's because we've seen the importance of fostering behavior changes, and to do that, we need a workflow-based solution. Think about that. When asked the purpose of training, many people in and out of L&D give answers like learning, knowledge, new skills, compliance, etc. But as people reflect on the desired end result from training, those answers start to change. The purpose of training becomes more about helping people develop so they can be better at doing what they do on behalf of their employer. Something like, the purpose of training is to improve competence and change the way people do things so they perform better and consistently get better results at work. For someone to develop a new behavior and do things differently, they have to start doing things differently. They have to do those different things enough times to get to a threshold level of competence. You need to provide them a sequence of activities and some different inputs over a period of time that are designed with the end result in mind. Then they need to do practice these activities even more to develop the new behavior into a habit that will be sustained over time. Learning without doing does not lead to behavior change. And I was so psyched that I actually got to quote James T. Kirk when I was putting my presentation together. <laughs> we learn by doing. Extra credit if anyone can put the movie that that quote comes from, the Star Trek movie that comes from. Um, anyway, as we mentioned, during the time they are practicing a new behavior, employees will need support, guidance, some information, maybe some coaching, and obviously the opportunity to do the practice required. What would a learning solution or learning program look like that made possible the combination of repeated practice and all the support and coaching needed for lasting learning transfer? You can create such a workflow learning program if you set out to do so using blended approaches, action and activity driven learning based on an accurate and deep assessment of learner needs. If you notice your approach becoming too content driven, take a step back and remember the behavior change you are working towards. What else can we do? As with any workflow, if the inputs are inadequate, the learning transfer part of the workflow can never produce the desired results. This highlights the need to measure the inputs and outputs to ensure they are adequate. Measure the inputs in two categories those required at the nominal beginning of the workflow and those required to support each step of the workflow that feeds into the next. Measure the final outputs to ensure that you are getting the necessary returns for the process to be worth doing at all. The 70-20-10 rule suggests that individuals learn via three main ways, on the job, via constructive feedback, and formal learning each method carrying a different weightage. On the job or experiential learning typically accounts for 70% of learning transfer. Learning through feedback or social learning typically accounts for 20% of learning transfer. And formal learning from scripted courses or events typically accounts for 10% of learning transfer. Blows your mind. 
when designing to maximize learning transfer effectiveness. Remember this rule. And integrate holistically. It can be tempting to see a learning solution designed without learning transfer in mind and add a bit of learning transfer to it. Resist the temptation. Take advantage of the benefits of a fully integrated learning transfer focused workflow based solution. Push for it. Even if you meet with apathy or resistance, use your knowledge to help change your culture and your learners for the better. So what's next? In the time we have left, I would like to open the session up for general comments and questions and maybe catch up with some of those questions or comments that have been flying into the YouTube comments. Uh, let me know what you think your next steps will be to begin transforming your learners. If you and your organization are creating opportunities for effective learning transfer, or you'd like to talk about the challenges you face in that regard, I'll do my best to offer what insight I can. Chris? Um, James, thank yes. you so very much. I've been so inspired and I was literally torn apart between listening to your content and observing the presentation and at the same time following the comments and the questions in the chat, there were so many. People were really expressing so much of a support to your ideas, especially when it came to this culture of learning, microculture of learning within the team and the management issue. So I think this was really something people could relate to. And thank you for leaving time for questions and answers. We have about 15 minutes for that. And I'd suggest that we start with some of the earlier questions we've received in the chat during your presentation, if you don't mind, shall uh, we? Yes, that sounds great. Okay. So one of the first questions uh, that we have received was from Lena Mina, and she asks, a culture of low engagement and no feedback can result in courses not being graded or evaluated, which in turn means that necessary changes may not be identified or made. How to change it? Wow, yeah. So you are someone who is very attached to the learning outcome, right? Because you're doing the work, you're creating the solutions, and you're noticing that the results aren't all they should be. But what can you do? Because in most cases, we get tasked with, quote, solving a problem, but solving the problem is essentially creating the learning solution that's supposed to solve the problem, right? And so after you're done, you're, you're supposed to be, quote, done, right? They want you to move on to something else. They have another problem they want you to solve with a learning solution, you know? Uh, so how do you change that? Well, my my experience, uh, in my experience, I have found that um, it always starts with people. Um, and if you are passionate and you understand the business value of creating learning solutions that effectively change behavior and actually result in those things that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, like reduced risk, lower operating costs, improved efficiency, higher performance, right? you can start to make a pretty uh, powerful argument for why failing to follow up and do something to adapt the solutions you're creating now so that they do a better job in the future is important. It And, you know, important enough to throw money at, you know, because again, you can always point to the time, energy, cost, et cetera, that it took to create the learning solution that's not doing a great job in the first place and say, hey, you know, next time you've got that kind of money you want to throw around, just give it to me, <laughs> you know, or let's use it to create a solution that's going to actually do a better job at solving the solution and start integrating them into that workflow, right? Involve the managers, involve the support network and talk to the other departments, either upstream or downstream from where this learning is happening and see what is impacting its effectiveness. Until you understand why it's not working, you will be hard pressed to come up with a solution and present it in a way that gets traction. So I really hope that helps and that answers that question. And I really appreciate that detailed comment. Answer and also I welcome everybody while we hear some questions uh, being discussed by myself and James. I also appreciate if 
you guys can share your thoughts and opinions because again this is something that we can learn this is something where we can all learn from each other so mm -hmm. if you don't mind james shall we proceed to one more question oh yes please okay so it comes from heather brown asking again very much related to what we've heard in an earlier question but i think since it resonates we should proceed uh, what is a step you can take to get buy-in from leadership managers supervisors to the importance of L and D. Ah, oh, the importance of L and D. Okay, so you um, you need to find ways to tie the output of L and D to business uh, to business requirements, business mission statements, business benefits. It's it's. I was very fortunate early on in my career to have a director who instilled in me the idea that. We were not an uh, an artsy an an artsy creative group. No, we were fundamentally there to save the company money and do what was necessary to make our budget, uh, you know, worth its weight. So, it show me the money. You know, like I said earlier in the presentation, you know, figure out exactly how you can tie the benefits and the output from the learning and development department to tangible benefits, reduced costs, better performance. You know, there, there are any number of ways in which you can be making a difference and should be, and you got to show them, you know, you, you got to, you got to make a business case. Basically, um, you, that'll get their attention there. They may, it sounds like your organization may not be expecting that. So do that. And you may find that you, by turning over a few rocks and making this presentation that you uncover a few champions who are actually willing to step up and, help back your claim. So good luck. I'm worried about not having access to your slides and also not having a chance to share this beautiful presentation, the video recording with their colleagues. I'd just like to make a kind reminder that all the materials of the speakers, the presentations together with the video recordings will be provided to you within a week after the end of the conference in your email. And for those who would like to share the presentation or the videos with their colleagues inside their organizations, they are very welcome to still register in our website because the registration is still open. So once they do that, they will also receive all the materials and all the videos from our conference. James, we still have some time, some good time. Would you like to proceed with several more questions? I would love to. That's why Absolutely. I'm here. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Chad is asking, at the end of the journey, how do you measure the KPIs to determine that your training made a difference? Pretty broad question, but still nevertheless, very, very important. Sure. Um, so the question about how to measure uh, reminds me of a resource that uh, Chris is going to be sharing, I believe. I, I provided some links to some resources that are going to help people dive more deeply into uh, learning transfer effectiveness. Um, and one of those links is to a page that will talk about the LTEM method, learning transfer evaluation methodology. Um, this is not new. Um, but I only learned about it myself, uh, you know, five or six years ago in my career. And I was, I found it remarkable in the practicality of this methodology. And you'll see that in the later five steps, five, six, seven, and eight, there are some great examples of how you can uh, set your learning up to be measured, right? And it's important to remember that unless you determine before you begin the process what it is you intend to measure at the far end, you will have no way of making that argument showing the value add, the value proposition that your learning solution has brought to the table. So I would say without knowing the specifics of your particular situation, um, do uh, take advantage or just Google LTEM uh, and and take a look at the, the there's a free template, a down, something you can download that's going to walk you through a lot of those measurable uh, measuring techniques. So I hope that helps. My fantastic colleagues, James, have already shared the link to Altem. Oh, good. So yeah, our chat is already discussing it, actually. Oh, OK. So, <laughs> technology makes it even faster for us. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Great, great. So 
I've got one more exciting question for you, James, which again, I very much appreciate your questions, dear attendees. It's so great to see how you discuss and exchange your opinions and please don't hesitate to ask. I think the learners community is exactly the community where asking questions shouldn't be something um, confusing or in any sense uncomfortable. So Larissa is asking, and I think this is something that can relate to many in the, in the attendees, among the attendees. What advice, James, would you give to someone trying to break into L&D from a traditional K-12 education role? Mm. Um, I, get that, I get that question a lot, Larissa, and thank you so much for asking. Um, I get that question from people that I'm connected with on LinkedIn. Um, there, in the past few years, I've noticed um, a great deal of activity around people transitioning, transitioning teachers, people trying to move into the business realm where L&D uh, and that aspect of L&D. Um, so one of the things about learning transfer, I, I mentioned that it gets the term and the how it's defined gets bandied about in several different ways, depending on your industry. Well, in if I'm not mistaken, in educational circles, um, learning transfer often relates just literally to that, the transfer of the knowledge or information on the part of the teacher to the student, you know, which is kind of similar to that knowledge, uh, knowledge as the output, right? The, the acquisition and retention of knowledge as the v perceived as the point of the, of the learning that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, but in, but in a corporate environment where, as a member of a highly productive and a high performing learning and development team, um, you are, uh, first of all, you're working, you have to show that you're able to work with others, right? If you're an individual instructor or teacher, um, you may be preparing all of your lesson plans, you know, yourself, obviously, and delivering that training, you're, you're, that's education yourself. Um, but as part of a learning and development department, you're going to wear a lot of hats. So you want to demonstrate when you're talking to somebody at for a job interview, for example, how many of your amazing variety of skills that I know teachers have can translate to things that are of value in a business setting. If you can, and I've seen some fabulous resumes on LinkedIn for people that are doing just that, people who are specifically calling out all the great things they do as teachers and, sh and drawing a direct line to how that would benefit a company, uh, and I can't imagine that any of them are having trouble getting attention. So um, that's that's my answer. It's it's all about putting yourself, you know, you're used to putting yourself in the mind of the learner. Well, put yourself in the mind of the business and, and understand what their learning and development department is trying to accomplish and figure out how to tell them that that's what you do. So I hope hopefully that's helpful. Uh, again, connect with me on LinkedIn, and uh, and there are a lot of resources on LinkedIn specifically around transitioning teachers. So, Larissa, I hope that helps. Quote in our chat, I think you've set uh, an example uh, by quoting a lot of fantastic people. Uh, you shared that, you showed this example, and now er lots of people started sharing their quotes. Kathleen shared um, a quote by Sat Goding, all artists are entrepreneurs and all entrepreneurs are artists. So I think this resonates very much to what you just said. All right. And uh, if you don't mind, let's do a, a wrap up with two very, very last short questions, and then we'll proceed to yet another fantastic presentation from our next speaker. So one quick question that we've had in the chat is, what do you mean under uh, social learning? Oh, so social learning is uh, learning that gets picked up by interacting with your peers um, uh, and feedback, uh, getting feedback. Like if you're sitting next to somebody on the job and you see them doing something that you didn't know how to do, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's really what it's talking about. It's informal by definition, um, but it's often pretty effective just because of the proximity you have to the source, right? You can keep going back to that person. I mean, they might hate you, <laughs> but you can keep going back to them and asking them to, for clarification until you get the opportunity to apply and make that practice your own. Uh, so that's social learning. Great, James. And I think we are just right in the time to ask the very last question about Star Trek. 
I have received so many different options. Believe me, I'm not a fan of Star Trek, unfortunately. And now half of the chat will probably hate me for that. But I've, I've received lots of different options, like the ones with the whales, um, the, the search for Spock, uh, the wrath of Han and uh, the return of the Jedi. So lots of different um uh, episodes. Which one is the right one, James? I'm very excited. I'm sure the guys are excited to learn. It is Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Okay, perfect. The Wrath of Khan. Yeah, we actually had many options like that. So I guess, unfortunately, we are not offering any Amazon gift cards for the right <laughs> answer to this question. But I do, but I would like to remind everyone, if you have enjoyed Jane's session, and I'm sure you have because that's what you shared in the, in the chat, Please don't hesitate to formulate your takeaways and insights and share on your LinkedIn page where you will, of course, connect with James as well. Use our official hashtag, tag us, and of course, you will be considered uh, as um, a potential winner for our contest that we've just announced in the start. James, I'm very grateful for this fantastic kickstart. We still have more than 360 people with us on air, which is amazing, means that this is something that people really, really, really appreciate. And right now, I will probably thank you and expect that you'll stay with us for a little more time, will you? Oh, absolutely. I can't wait. Thank you, James. Very, very shortly, we will be transitioning to our next session. Thank you, James. I hope to see you later. Thank you very much and enjoy Ice Spring Days, everyone. You're in for a treat. Yes, thank you, James.